Right. Let's have a go. Okay, so I would like to welcome you to the 10th Women's Climbing Symposium. It seems absolutely crazy to think that the Women's Climbing Symposium started 10 years ago at the climbing hangar with just 50 women. It was a concept we weren't sure whether it would, would work, um, but to be here now and seeing our journey over the last 10 years and to really know we've lived to our values of connecting, developing and inspire women's climbing. And I think that says so much that we're here today with thousands of people tuning in from all over in the middle of a global pandemic. And yeah, we've got so many of our regulars to the Women's Climbing Symposium as well. So hi to Team Iceland and Team Ireland who I know are watching. Um, and we've also got so many new people, which is absolutely amazing and it's great to have you all. So yeah, if you wanna pop into the comments and let us know where you're tuning in from, that'd be great. And um, as you can tell, the UK is back in its second lockdown, so we're all here in our homes. And um, this used to be my gorgeous bedroom. It was my happy place. Now it's my even happier place because we turned it into a boardroom for lockdown. So yeah, we're all we're all at home, and I guess that's really weird for us because we're used to being on stage now, uh, confronted with like at least 400 women all crammed on to the climbing mats on wobbly deck chair things so yeah we're a bit uh we're a bit sad not to be in that place but you know on the flip side it means that we can try and achieve our mission of connect develop inspire to a much wider community um in a covid safe way um and i'm i'm hoping it won't be like this forever because i love the event and i love to be there but hopefully this is the next best best thing um and you know it's really really nice that we've um got something together i'm i'm really chuffed about it um and the other thing is it's all so quite nice and to ask you for me, like where are the toilets which ones are the best toilets to go to where are the fire exits so you know we don't have to do any of that anymore <laughs> um, some things are always the same though and we were only able to develop this year's program and the content that we've got planned for you um, due to the support of our amazing lead sponsors and that's adidas 510 they've been so on board with our mission for so many years and we really couldn't do this without them Today we're running an Instagram competition. I know some of you are pros at this, um, so I'm expecting to see your names out there. If you could post a picture of yourself watching the talk from wherever you are, tagging women's climbing 510 and hashtag WCS20, um, we'll pick some winners a little bit later. And yes, this year, unlike in 2016, I have checked the hashtag and it does not get used by the Western Conservative Summit in support of Donald Trump, so we're okay. <laughs> I can't believe we did that. Um, it is a great honour and pleasure for me to introduce our guest speaker at our first event of the WCS 2020. Sasha is obviously going to be telling you a lot more about Sasha, but we are incredibly psyched to have Sasha involved. And Sasha has been such a passionate advocate for women's sport throughout her career. And today she's going to be giving us her angle on the good, the bad and the ugly of being a female climber over the last decade. And yes, yeah, she's going to be taking questions at the end. So if you want to pop those in the Q&A box just at the bottom of your screen. And yeah, over to you, Sasha. Thank you so much for being here. Awesome. No, Shauna and um, Emma and uh, Rebecca, thank you so much for organizing this and everyone tuning in. Hello, virtually, I wish we could be together in person, but hopefully next year. Um, it's, it's, um, going, it's, it's a weird time to be quite frank in our year and our time in the US here, we have a lot to celebrate today with the first ever female vice president and also the turning of the tide. Um, for me, I'm wearing blue because I am hopeful that um, our new president will inspire a lot more just overall justice and trust in democracy and um, equality and, and some of the things that we're going to talk about today. Um, I do have a presentation and I'll be toggling between the presentation and just talking to you guys through the screen because I feel like 
it's already almost like a little impersonal because we're not here together. So I don't want to just abandon to the screen entirely, but um, I'll start out with a little background of who I am for those of you who don't know and kind of bring you up to speed to where I'm at today. Um, and then I also want to go over, yeah, the progression of women in the last decade has been absolutely phenomenal um, from, from women of all sorts of different disciplines. Um, obviously, women have gone through a lot of, um, I mean, myself as the example, um, attribution of success and criticism and um, you know, there, it, it hasn't always been like this super easy journey, at least for me. Um, so I want to bring you guys through that. And then of course, as we're going, I'll be keeping an eye out on the chat too. So chime in, I'll throw out some questions and whether I respond directly to you or not, I'll be reading them. Um, but let me just share my screen to begin. Um, so this is me. I am a professional climber, public speaker. Um, I was actually in the UK earlier this year before the COVID outbreak, and I was in 14 different cities across 14 days, so quite a bit. And I got to meet some of you guys in person, maybe that are joining today. Um, I work with a lot of uh, philanthropic organizations, including on the board of the Women's Sports Foundation since 2012. And this, in the last two years, I founded Female Folks Adventures, which is a production company that I have high hopes of really developing and utilizing into really a platform to share other women's content, not just my own, but also to hire and share stories from other content creators, um, from videographers, photographers, producers, directors. So um, at the end here, I'll dive into one of my latest projects that I'm currently working on. Um, this is me. These are some of my accolades that I'm proud of. Um, I am, I would say, one of the points at the end there, Columbia University graduate, I always like to include because I will go over my perspective on education and how it's really fit into my journey within climbing. Um, as women, we're always trying to do so many things at once. And I think that women, from my bias perspective, are really great multitaskers. And through education and balancing a professional climbing career with being a full-time student, I think that that is definitely a skill that I look to as having been honed by going to university and having just this additional challenge to try and really like full, um, do like a more, more wholesome build out of who I am and to, to understand that I could be pursuing all of these different things while also being in university. Um, so this comes to the beginning, like I, for those of you guys who don't know, my um, family is Canadian. Um, recently I posted about the U.S. election and received some comments like, are you even American? Which I thought was hilarious because I am American too. Um, but this photo, I grew up figure skating. My brother was a hockey player. Um, he played throughout university and, um, I, you know, I dabbled in a lot of different sports. Climbing was something that I just, I just like always wanted to be climbing things, whether it was like the chimneys in my house and like the door frames. Um, yeah, send in in the chat if like you also were a kid uh, growing up and utilizing anything in anywhere of your house to climb. But I figure skated, I also played soccer, which I was terrible at. Um, I did ballet mainly for training for figure skating. I competed in figure skating from as about like six to 12. Um, and then this is a journal entry from my first time climbing. Uh, my brother had a birthday party at a local climbing gym and like, this is clearly chicken scratch, but I was really into it. And that's how I started. So it was 1998, um, which is kind of wild because we're in 2020 now. 
Um, and I joined the local junior team program and I started going to the gym. Then I walked in um, to the gym one Saturday morning in 1999 to a competition being held at the climbing gym. And this is kind of like a collage that I made of my first competition is on the left. Um, then I've over on the right side, I've got like some of my first climbing outdoor adventures and a US junior nationals is in the far right up hand corner. And then the middle is me climbing outside and I'm about like six or seven. Um, and I love this quote by Tony Hawk, which is I was a self-proclaimed professional because, and I'm just gonna stop sharing real quick to come back to you guys. I, um, I grew up in a household where no one knew what climbing was and no one at my school climbed. It was like such an other thing that I was actually pretty embarrassed to be quite frank about um, what my, um, my passion in climbing because I couldn't as like a young elementary school then middle school student who wanted to kind of fit in but also had this like overwhelming passion on the side. Um, it wasn't something that I could relate to with the other kids. And also my, my parents didn't really know what it was. My mom really took an active role in learning how to belay, which she like started belaying me when I was like nine years old and she still belays me. Um, and I've like coined her the name um, Mom Belay. Um, and she was awesome. She would like take me to different competitions and drive me around really the country to fulfill my passion. But my dad and I, sometimes we had a, a complicated relationship and I always wanted to prove to my family that it was a legitimate sport. Um, and so I think that I go to this, um, this quote as sorry um this self-proclaimed professional because as i started kind of going through the ranks of i had my first sponsor when i was 12 um and that was mad rock i don't know if any of you guys still use mad rock shoes but that was my my actually first climbing shoes that i ever wore were some 510 dragons they were like the old school velcro ones and then um, when I was 12 after winning like some international junior competitions and um, I came second place at Canadian bouldering nationals for open women, I started kind of like getting recognized by some companies and um, getting, you know, free shoes. Um, some like I never showed my parents or anyone my contracts and they definitely weren't like anything to write home about, but I was trying to support myself and put um, funds towards what my parents were paying because I wanted to contribute. And um, I've always maybe like taken myself too seriously, but I've always been really interested in how to be as professional as I can be. Um, and so as I started competing, um, you know, I started through the junior nationals, then um, going through the open nationals, competing on the World Cup stage. Um, I see if I can, I, this is from a World Cup actually in Boulder, Colorado, where I now live. Um, I kind of was really consumed in the indoor world because I was originally from a city and that's what I knew of, um, was indoor climbing. Outdoor climbing was something that I do for fun on the side, but really like my focus was these competitions. Um, and that's actually skipping ahead. So I'm going to stop sharing, come back to you guys real quick, but, um, at, so when I graduated from high school, which was in 2011, I had decided that I was going to take the next year off and defer my acceptance to Columbia um, University, which was in New York City, where I went to school after, um, and just travel and compete. And um, one of my goals was to do well in the Arco World Championships. And I remember that. Um, 
so I, I, I had had kind of like a breakout year that year in 2011 in the spring, I climbed two of my first 514 C's, which is an 8C plus and started having more recognition within the international community. Um, and then I won the female overall medal at ARCA World Championships, which was frankly like a total surprise to me. I came second in the bouldering event, um, which I wasn't, I've always kind of considered myself more of a lead climber and that's just what I felt better at. Um, and so all of a sudden I was getting this like international recognition, but also um, this was my first foray into, it's 2011, the internet, my senior project in high school was to build my website. And I remember it was like super early days of like, um, you know, joining Facebook and I didn't even have an Instagram account at that point. Um, online forums existed and I started seeing there is this blog by um, Evening Sense that w said climbers who cheat. And that was the caption. And I remember it talking about climbers who lose weight and start doing, um, being more successful in their climbing. And that, um, that felt like a, a total attack to some of my recent climbs that I had done at this point, because um, what I was going through and what I couldn't really talk about at the time um, was disordered eating. And that was something that I just, I saw so prevalently on the World Cup circuit as I was trying to become better. And, and in the first years that I was competing, I felt almost like the heavier out of place, like American um, on the circuit. And everyone looked really ripped and like defined muscle. And I like wanted to train and, and like embody that image. Um, and I started being really cognizant of what I was putting in my body um counting calories um being being really self um harmful to be quite frank of like i would get on the scale and um if i was above the low number that i think that like during that time when i was 18 um i hit puberty late um i didn't actually hit puberty until i was about 18 or 19 years old and and um then you know i was i was around like 94 95 pounds at that point which is um quite a bit less than i am now and if i was more than that it would dictate how i felt like i was going to climb that day and i think that i bring this up now at the front of the presentation because i think that disordered eating is something really prevalent in climbing that is a part of my journey that i've been um, has led me to where I stand with um, learning more and speaking to nutrition, but also um, really owning and feeling empowered in my own body is um, maybe more of a success to me than any of my, you know, sends that I've done outside or competition results inside. But it was a really difficult year for me, which was also, um, it was full of a lot of success, but with success came being under this critical limelight that was the media and other people's opinions of what was going on. Um, and so then um, let me just skip back to sharing these. Um, this is a photo that I'm sure, well, I don't know, I don't wanna assume, but like, I think a lot of you guys have seen, this is from Pure Imagination. Um, so I've won the world championships that summer and continued competing and came back to the U.S. and still on this year off from school. And um, I had seen this video of Jonathan Segrist climbing um, this climb called Pure Imagination. And so I was like, you know, Adidas had actually started sponsoring me in 2011, which was a huge um, catalyst to my career. And with them, I was speaking to the US team, uh, Greg Thompson at the time. And I said, I'd love to go to the Red River Gorge and climb pure or try. I said, try 
pure imagination. Um, and, and at the time I didn't even know what 9A felt like at the time it was graded 9A. Um, I just wanted to go and try it. And so I went with Keith Ledzinski and Andy Mann, who are two videographers who at the time I didn't even know. I just flew there. Um, Adidas had arranged for the video crew to come and meet me and kind of document me trying this next level for me in climbing. Um, and it's funny now because looking back, you know, Keith lives on my street now here in Boulder and we've kept this really, um, tight friendship that, um, is just testament to what can be so enriched through climbing and through these experiences. Um, and same with Andy Mann, but that trip, um, it took me three days and on my sixth try, I climbed pure imagination. Um, and it was like this totally, um, surprise, like world changing moment, because I think that I peg it to realizing that I was capable of something that I didn't know that I was capable of. Um, and for a little bit of like context for women's achievements in sport was in 1993, Lynn Hill did the first ever, you know, men or women achievement in, in free climbing the nose of El Capitan, which to this day stands to me as like the most impressive, um, climbing achievement in history. And, um, then in 2002, Yosune from Spain climbed a 9A and that was like, um, the hardest climb that a woman had ever achieved. Um, in 2005, she went on, um, it was actually her third 9A, and this was 9A, 9A plus called Bimbaluna in Switzerland. And then there is like this lag between 2005 and 2011, where there wasn't another like, you know, pushing the envelope of another woman climbing a 9A until August, um, when I remember Charlotte Jarif did PPP. And even then I remember reading through climbing media and like, there were so many outlets saying that she lied about it, that it, and, and I remember thinking like, this is such an injustice to women in climbing because here's this woman who did this incredible feat and people are questioning whether or not it's true. Um, and so I think that, um, that to me was one of the first instances coupled with feeling this new um, kind of surge of criticism that was I was reading about of other people's opinions of, you know, Sasha's climbing hard because she weighs nothing or Sasha did that climb because she has little fingers so she can crimp more. Um, and all of this is like really negative feedback because first of all, confronting an eating disorder as cheating when it's coupled with such deep rooted ties to societal issues, but also it just completely discounts all of the effort that I feel like women put into um, really trying to um, climb their hardest and like, you know, push the envelope of what women are capable of in the sport. So this is kind of all going on in the background. Um, and then in 2011, in October is when I climbed Pure Imagination. And then in the spring, I went on to climb Aravea, which was another 9A in Spain. And I remember after that, um, really feeling like there is just like this like floodgates of women achieving like 9As. Um, and then in, I think it was 2017, Margot Hayes climbing a 9A plus, and then Angie Eider shortly after that climbing a 9B. And so I think that we've seen like undoubtedly this incredible progression of women in climbing over the last decade. So that's like kind of going from 2005 to 2011 and then 2011 to all these subsequent years after that that was like becoming, I, I feel like women have really been pushing the limits of what is possible to such an extensive degree. Um, and then that kind of opened this other discussion of like the debate 
over whether female, sorry, I, I totally um, forgot to go back <laughs> to my slides. Um, so here I am on pure imagination. Um, this was kind of like this, this unfolding of um, being on the cover of magazines, feeling like my life is, um, like I was on Oprah, which was pretty awesome. Um, and feeling like climbing is getting this limelight, but also feeling like more opinions of um, what I'm doing in my career, um, being questioned whether or not I deserve this success, um, having this attributing factor of um, whether, um, whether, you know, I deserve the, the sponsorship or recognition that I did. Um, it was kind of ongoing. And, and so this is where I come back to female focused, um, first female sense. And that's the debate over whether do, a female doing something is worth connotating it with the female first, or if it should just be first descent and that's it. And then if a woman does something first, is it worth noting? And this is where I stand is that um, when a woman does something for the first time that's of significance, and that can be, um, I think it's it's just a really subjective subject because there's gray area. In my personal opinion, I think it needs to be a climb worth noting to really have the attention of like first female ascent. Um, but at the same time, there could be a 8A that's historically like really burly and no woman has ever done it. And saying first female ascent, I think is a historical context that highlights female achievements that really just shows um, what women are doing and how these floodgates are further opening. Um, someone just commented that Julia Schnordery just sent her first 9B, which is like, we can't even keep up. Like I'm speaking and women are achieving these things. And I think that it is worth flagging these achievements. Um, and as I kind of got more into working with the Women's Sports Foundation, this cause became something that I wanted to talk to with other female leaders of other sports. So I remember not only speaking to Lynn Hill about it, about like the significance of whether or not we should, um, we should really be annotating first female sense. And her giving me this context of there's no reason to eliminate the celebration of female success in sport. So why get rid of this historical annotation? Um, and then speaking to Billie Jean King, who um, kind of like furthered this point of saying, you know, when a, a female achieves something and they are in a traditionally male background sport, then yes, it is definitely worth noting these achievements and celebrating them. Um, and so that's kind of where I really began to feel quite vocal about, um, about, about expressing this feeling. Um, so when I, in 2012, I returned and I started university. I went to Columbia University in New York City. And um, this was a kind of challenging time for me because I was in school studying nonfiction writing and business management, and at the same time trying to be a professional climber. And I guess something that I don't talk about a lot is I was responsible for putting myself through school. Um, and I, in the US, education is incredibly expensive, unfortunately. Um, Columbia was 52 grand a year for two semesters. Um, and this was a big turning point for me in the way that I started to see my success in climbing. So climbing is like this passion of mine, the sport, this thing that I've done since I was six. And it also is becoming um, so vividly like my job. Um, and I have responsibilities for paying my bills and for putting myself through college um, and feeling like there is this time constraint over what I can do, how often I can um, 
really be training if I'm in the middle of midterms. Um, so finding that balance for me was kind of this ongoing struggle, but it also was a turning point in the way that I saw my professional career developing because I began seeing the business of sport. And as I think that this goes back kind of to the imposter syndrome that I was talking about before, because as I was doing, as I was in school, then I would get to summer break and I would go on these like big climbing expeditions. This is actually after I graduated from school, but it's from Mora Mora and Madagascar. Um, and I come to my building my brand. And this is something that I think that women in the professional space are often knocked down on. And that's like when a woman is successful, there's often this attribution of why and does she deserve it? And um, kind of all of these like parameters that are not lifting women up. And I think that I've always kind of seen it as we've been as women so conditioned to see that there's only one seat at the table and that's because historically there has only been one seat at the table and um i've started really wanting to build that other table um these are my sponsors who i started working with and um as you can see some of them are more mainstream um and then also the film Thropic organizations that I work with. And that be came because it was like in building my career, I, it came down to what do I believe in? What do I stand for? What are my values? And this is all outside of sport because can kind of tangentially to the woman's um, really like development in sport over this decade is also branding and social media. And, um, celebrities and athletes had traditionally been told don't have an opinion don't get political don't be controversial um and i started seeing like i'm building this platform where you know it's like i'm posting a little photo to a square grid and people are following along and listening but why would that be the only thing that i'm putting out there um to to be um here i am back to be really like taking advantage of this platform and this voice of change that I believe that women can have, whether in the executive space or in the sports space or in the celebrity space. Um, and so organizations like the Women's Sports Foundation became so, and this is like, I'm so honored to be speaking at the Women's Climbing Symposium. And it's amazing how Shauna mentioned like in 2011, there. 50 women and now we've got like over 400 people just on this zoom um where really like owning my achievements became a big thing and um you know over the course of my of when i was in school um i stopped competing because i started realizing that i've always believed that you're the most successful when you're doing something that you feel the most passionate about. And that became outdoor climbing to me. And first it started with like sport climbing. And then I went to the Dolomites in Italy in 2012. And I climbed my first big wall, which was Bella Vista, um, Entre Cime Oeste. And it was just like such an adventure. I was like hooked to the whole idea of like, being out there in nature and like being kind of just like all consumed by this project. And the only thing I'm thinking about is the climb in front of me and like survival and me and my climbing partner. Um, and so over the next years, that was kind of like the progression that I saw in my career. Um, but when it came to the next slide is from the trilogy. Um, I had been, um, I had been, in a relationship with my main climbing partner and everything was really like colliding and collapsing um in the spring of 2018 for me um i had flown to the redon in france to climb and i received a call from my mom and this was like i'd flown from the us to france um, and she was like, 
Bubba, which is my grandma, is on her last days. She something it was a stomach intestinal issue that had kind of freakishly occurred. And she was like, You should probably fly back and this these may be your last days to say goodbye. So I turned around from, we had flown into Nice. I had met my partner who, who is someone who I was in a relationship with. Um, and I flew back to Toronto, which shout out to those of you who have joined Toronto. Um, and I was there to be with her and with my family. And um, at this time, I am like, my heart is breaking for my grandma. Um, I'm clearly jet lagged, um, flown round trip to Europe in like the span of two days and someone who has routinely been the, the like ringleader of creating drama around my name and, um, really just like making jokes consistently to my face or behind my back, um, makes this meme. And I'm sure all of you guys know of like, well, maybe some of you do, some of you don't. And it was this meme to an Instagram account, which was a private account. Um, but the private account, I've always believed that what you put on the internet is public. And so this kind of goes back to what I began saying of this struggle that is an ongoing um, struggle with, with body confidence and feeling um like I've gone through disordered eating and finding um, both the societal acceptance of what I look like because I'm an athlete and that's different from what's put out in media, but also the inextricable ties that are um, within sport and within performance and tied to weight with a gravity sport like climbing. Um, and a friend of mine sends me this screenshot of this meme that this other professional climber has shared um that's essentially making fun of me as being like a and he's chosen a very body positive woman who i since have established a connection and have spoken to over the years and i'm really thankful for this connection i've always believed that that things come out of the worst as well um, and so I see this meme and I'm like, you know what, this is, this is it. I can't, I'm not going to let this behavior go on for women like me who struggle with their own confidence. Um, it, if any of you have gone through disordered eating, if all of a sudden you are called essentially, um, obese on the internet to a public to a big crowd of your other colleagues who are other professional athletes in the space by someone who is being um, paid to be an ambassador of the sport. That to me was just unacceptable. So I shared it. Um, and this is all, you know, spring of 2018. Um, I share it. It's a really divisive time because I receive messages from all over the sides of um, it feels really divisive because some people agree with me, some people don't agree with me, some professional climbers, um, men, um, send me messages like, you fucking destroyed this person's career, and sorry, I didn't mean to curse, um, but that was verbatim what they said. And um, so I kind of back to building my brand and, and finding the confidence as I guess my profession has grown a large, um, a large attribute of what I feel is a part of my value system is standing up for myself, but also knowing my experience as a female climber growing up and, and looking up to Lynn Hill. But um, I, before that, I didn't really, I honestly didn't know who I looked up to you and who I related to because a lot of climbing that I looked up to were men. Um, and I, I've always just wanted to be a, a other source of inspiration for women who may be looking for someone who just owns who they are from the background that I have, which is from an urban background. And I've always felt really feminine. Um, my favorite color is pink, which I like, I don't hide. Um, but being taken down for that by 
people and, and by media, it, um, it's been something that I've had to grow into. And so after I shared this post, it was kind of like my world felt like it was disintegrating in a way of not knowing like if I had done the right thing, but feeling in my heart that I had done the right thing because I stood up for myself. Um, that then I just wanted to like escape and I wanted to go on an adventure. So um, here I'm going to return to my slide. Um, and this is from the trilogy. So I had read about this climbing um, big wall project that Sonny Trotter had completed in the Banff region of Canada, the Canadian Rockies. And it was basically three big wall 514 um, climbs that I wanted to go and do the first female ascent of, the second ascent of, um, and to really just escape and like go on a climbing project and be fully immersed and just like, you know, being there and like doing what I love. And so I, at this point, I have broken up with my main climbing partner, who is the person I was in a relationship with. And I am feeling all sorts of like doubt and uncertainty because I've been, um, you know, like fed this idea of me having done certain big walls because of a male being present. And that always ate away at me because I would be the one leading the crux pitches. We both would lead the crux pitches um, on climbs like Mora Mora or, you know, other climbs that I've done in the past. Um, and when a male has been present, I've felt like um, people have a way of suggesting that someone does something because a woman can lean on that male that's present. And so taking off to the trilogy, I really felt like this is my time that I want to like stamp it in there and believe in myself and go out and do these climbs with climbing partners that I meet who will belay me and support me and um, just focus on me. And when I did this project, so I think I, I have a... Um, I'm going to go back to the slides real quick. Um, it was like this euphoric moment of everything that had happened that spring of someone tearing down my, my body, um, suggesting in, in other things and other forums of um, not totally like feeling like I should have the success that I have, which I've always defended with, um, I work really hard and that's the one thing I can guarantee and, and nothing, I will never claim that I'm the best climber in the world in any means because I don't believe that I am, but I will always say that I, I will put my best foot forward. Um, and also doing these three climbs and not having someone else having, like I wasn't swapping leads, I was leading every pitch of these big walls. Um, so I think that in this moment, I really felt empowered and I had taken off, um, and I didn't actually leave, go on this project with like a big production crew because I felt like I just wanted to like check out and be there and be on these climbs, um, with friends and, and just be climbing. But I did hire people throughout the project um, to come and film in like the days that I was sending or it felt close, I would hire um, a work for hire contract and have a local videographer come and be with me. And so in that fall, I founded Female Focused Adventures, which was my production company. And, and it is um, right now currently working on a documentary that I'll show, tell you guys about next. But this was my first film that I myself wanted to produce. And the reason I started the production company was because I think often in ways of um, climbing media and climbing production companies, I felt like you lose control of the narrative of the story that's being told about you. And I wanted to set up a production company that I could have control of the narrative and be the producer of these films 
um, and really tell my story and tell it in a really, um, in a way that really like resonated with me. So that was, that was the start of Female Folks Adventures, which then the first film was the trilogy. And now, um, then, uh, after the trilogy, I was like, no, I really want to, um, I want to go on this like trip with an all female expedition where there isn't a male present for anyone to say anything about like discounting our success. Um, and so I had this climb in mind, which was this tower in Sao Tome, which is a little island off the west coast of Guinea in Africa. And um, I had been on an ice climbing trip with this woman named Angela Van Wiermish, and she was such an awesome, badass, like gritty woman. And I was so impressed by her. So I was like, let's go and like try this climb. And so I made this whole plan of hiring a female producer, two videographers that were female, a female director, and um, Angela and myself. And we went, we, Female Focus Adventures, which is my production company funneled through kind of like the support of Adidas and my other sponsor, Red Bull, and then also my savings. Um, are financing this expedition. And we're going kind of just like into the unknown. Um, this is when we're in Lisbon, we're like packing our bags, trying to figure out how we can get, there's like this intense bag limit of like, you get up 23 kilos per person um, on the little like hopper plane that went to Guinea and then over to Sao Tome from Lisbon. And so we had to go kind of navigate like the pre-expedition rambles of like figuring out how we're going to get like we had uh 435 kilos of luggage to actually get there how we're going to air freight it over and then we get to this climb and like here we are looking at it for the first time i've got like this hand-drawn topo from eager and a neko po who had done the first ascent and we like get there and we're like looking at this tower um and then like any expedition you kind of like are preparing for all of the variables you're packing in to go be in the jungle for a month. Um, and something that was terrifying me, as you can see, um, the snake boots here, like there are these black mamba snakes, which I um, I know about you guys, I like can't stand reptiles, really can't stand snakes. Um, if you're bit by a black mamba, like the joke is that like, it's okay because you die so fast. Um, so we, we kind of like prepare as best we can. Then we head into the jungle. And so you can see here, I did hire a male expedition chef because I thought let's change the story a little bit. And, um, traditionally there's like a, um, female cooking for the men at the base camp. So let's have a male cooking for the female. Um, and it got really gritty. It was like, we experienced a month of really awful weather um where it was just constant monsoon weather and um this photo follows this is what i'm looking at so um the conditions were just constantly wet um which eventually led to a lot of rockfall um and there are no like showers or there just like isn't any niceties when you're on an expedition which is something that I love about being out um, on expedition is just like, it's so grounding and you feel so stripped of all of these like material things that exist in your daily life that you can really like connect back to the heart and soul of like what you're doing and like, um, you know, just sit around at your tents feeling like, like laughing at the misery of it. Like this is like probably like day 19 of being in the jungle and we've like got our tents all lined up under a little ledge um which was the only ledge um above us that we could find to prevent these like rock missiles from falling at night because there was so much rock fall um and that was a condition that we were dealing with was like it felt like we were climbing this waterfall and like the rock you can see here like there was no reason to even use a chalk bag. Like I stopped bringing a chalk bag up like day eight or something of working on the climb. Um, but this kind of goes back 
to these like fundamentals of an expedition or how I relate um, fundamentals to being a woman and really like growing your career in whatever scope that is. And that's your attitude, your effort, and your behavior um, are what you can control. Um, and, and that is coming down to like, you can control your mindset and you can't control all of these other variables that are going to happen and come your way that, um, may be unpredictable. And so I guess back to the, back to the story is, um, here is me and Angela and Savannah. We're just like wearing our raincoats, climbing, and like I'm wearing like the my shelter jacket, which is like actually meant for cities, but it's so comfortable and it's like city outdoor jacket is like it's like climbing on the tent on. Um, and we're this is where we sleep on some nights because when we're making progress on the wall and trying to go for these summit pushes, like um, on the in this account we had run out of food and water. Um, and it, it was kind of ironic because it had been raining the entire trip. And I guess um, cutting towards the end, we got this one like weather window that opened at the last days. We had about like four days before our flights were taking off from Sao Tome back to Portugal. Um, and we we're like, this is our window. This is like, the if we can get to the top of this climb, um, we need to go. So it all happened in like haste and we didn't bring enough water or food. Um, so here's Angela and I waking up over the night, we had taken a little plastic bag and collected drip water from the rock that was just like seeping out. And we collected like a liter of water. So the three of us had that. Remember we had like, I. it's kind of ironic because I've been under such a quest to learn more about nutrition and nutrient timing for your body with um, optimizing performance as it relates to my own journey of not feeling like I ever knew that. And that's why I went under this um, rabbit hole of deprivation and not necessarily like having the right team in place when I was younger that led into this kind of like spiral of disordered eating. Um, we have like really salty food, like jerky and like potato chips and no water. So we're, it, you can kind of see in our face, like we're just like not loving it. Um, but this was as we were nearing the top, we like saw the shadow of the tower. And I love this shot because you can see like the green canopy below us and how remote of an island we're on. Um, and just like that satisfaction of when you do something that you don't know you're capable of and how um, you, know, you can be like underscored throughout your whole journey. But what really matters is what you feel and what you get out of it. Um, and that's, that's, I guess, been, that's really been like my experience in climbing is that learning to believe in myself and learning to stand by what I believe in as the number one most valuable thing. Um, and then in support of that, building a network of people around me that really can believe in me and give me positive feedback, but also the constructive criticism I need in a healthy manner. Um, and that's something that in women in climbing media, I really hope that we can change the narrative too, because I, I think it's all about the approach um, and, and stigmatizing women or attributing like why they've done something because of a disorder they're going through or because of their frame, um, you know, being told like, I've done something because my fingers are small. I've always thought, well, I'm five two, like maybe I wouldn't have needed to use that hold if I was like taller. Um, so I, I think that I, I just try and digest it in um, as much of like a comical way as I can um, internally to process through criticism, but then it's also like choosing our battles and standing up for each other. I think it's just so important. It's like, how do we empower each other to push each other and to celebrate our successes um, and call out the bullshit when the bullshit exists. 
Um, and, and so I, I want to go back to this because it's like this photo really embodied, um, two women coming together to try and do something that they didn't know was possible. And then this photo was once we came down there, all the local guys in the village, um, had kind of like seen us when we had first gotten to Satome and been like woman, woman, you know, belong in the house. And, um, it was just what they were used to. So when we had all these like portal edges that we were hiking into the jungle and all this gear, they're like, what are they doing? Like it, it, we weren't taken seriously. And then when we came down, this was like their face of when we were sharing the journey, um, which was pretty special. Um, and then I, lastly, I wanted to go into the advertisement of climbing, because I think that when it comes to climbing media, and I highlight this because this is something I did when I was younger, and I don't actually love the makeup in this at all, but I do think it's fun to see climbing being kind of like packaged in these new ways. And what led to a decision that I did this January that was really big for me was this brand of Jean Provocateur reached out to me um, and asked me about this lingerie campaign. And my first response was like, no, um, just because I've always, I've always not wanted to strip down for Instagram. Um, and in that way, I don't criticize anyone who does. I just, I've always wanted my followers to not follow me because of any sort of body parts I'm putting out there, but because of my achievements. And, um, but then at the heart of feminism for me is choice. And it's like how you choose to, um, put yourself out there, what you choose to wear, what the story behind it is. And so when I spoke to the creative director of this, um, of this campaign, her name was Sarah Shotton. And she was that she's actually the wife of, um, Patrick who runs a climbing chain in the UK. Um, and I don't want to say which one, cause I don't want to get it wrong. Um, and anyway, so she reached out and she, we had this great conversation and, at the end of the day, I decided to do the campaign. And the reason for it was because of kind of everything that I've brought you guys through over my last 10 years of this journey in climbing media and women's empowerment. And that was feeling like I was finally at this point that I could be proud and own my body and what it looks like and acknowledge that I still look at photos of myself and see critiques, but like, to put myself out there in this uncomfortable um, arena and to really just try and like celebrate women athletic physiques. Um, and to me, that is what this campaign really embodied. Um, and so I guess um, kind of coming back to me is, is there, there, in my opinion, and I'd love to hear questions from you guys, there will always be people who want to underscore your success and always going to be um, opinions out there. Um, and I think that women go through it in a much harsher lens than men do. But what excites me is that there are symposiums like this where we can all speak to each other and like hear stories of maybe something that we can relate to um and find the common ground and then also start like building that new table because i think that if there isn't room for another seat um instead of knocking each other down and not celebrating our successes we should really think of how we can expand that table or just build one that's much stronger and more inclusive um and so I guess with that, before the q and I do have a surprise for you guys, and that is something that I'm launching this November 18th is this chalk bag, um, which is really just supposed to be a, um, an expression of inclusion and creativity and also femininity and owning who you are in climbing. And the proceeds of it will go to Right to Play, which is an international organization that I work with that really 
um, creates organized activities for kids from around the world in underdeveloped regions to have access to sport. And I've worked with them with inner city kids getting out to go climbing at local climbing gyms or outside. Um, so yeah, that's just like something to look for, or here's the face to look forward to before the Q and A, um, is this little monster. Um, so yeah, thank you for listening. Um, I hope I didn't lose you guys to the bottom of the screens and hope welcome back climbing symposium. <laughs> hey, thanks so much, Sasha. Um, just before we start to, uh, ask you some questions and thank you everybody for putting your questions in the Q and A um, and to give Sasha a little bit of time to have a drink and, and rest her voice. Um, just to announce the winners of the Instagram competition, um, get in touch with me a little bit later um, via womensclimbing at gmail.com. Emily Groves, who is knitting, uh, Samantha Lavorato and Isabel McClurg. So if you could all drop me a line a little bit later, we'll sort out your prizes. Cool, Sasha, are you ready? Yeah, I'm totally ready. Loads of questions for you here. Um, we'll start towards the beginning. So um, a question from Ness. How prevalent do you think eating disorders are in climbing today? Um, frankly, I think they're really prevalent. I think that climbing competition, the format that's changed over the years is, in my opinion, positive for um, fostering a more um healthy body type because climbing competitions back in even like the early 2000s up to like the turn of the new decade in 2010 2011 was a lot about how long you could climb and stay on the wall and endurance has been really related to like this strength to weight ratio um but what i think that we're learning as climbing um nutrition and science like sports science has been advancing is the ways in which we can increase strength so like i never i never did um you know weights or anything up until i was like in my early 20s and now that's like a, a large part of what i do and that's like because i don't want to i don't even get on a scale <laughs> to be honest like i don't want that that information um i i did like go to the doctor the other day to get a physical and like i just I was laughing with a friend of mine the other night because she was like, she's like a really like healthy, awesome woman. And she like went to the doctor and she's like, the scale of the doctor's office is broken. Um, and we are laughing at like how every time you go to get a physical, like you're wearing like your full clothes, like your shoes and you're like, can I just like take these off first? Um, but yeah, I think not to go tangential, I think it is common. I think that it's getting better. I hope, I think that, um, when I started having more attention around my career and when I was like at the turn of like 18 years old um, and I realized that people were looking to me as an example, I felt like this total guilt complex of not being healthy myself and like recognizing that I needed to change that because um, I didn't want young girls to look at photos of me like at an unhealthy weight and think that that was like something to aspire to. Awesome, thank you. And um, quite a lot of people asking sort of similar questions about do you have any advice for anybody who struggles with either poor body image or an eating disorder? Um, so things that I do, um, I work with a nutritionist, which I know like it's it's a privileged thing to do but understanding your body, um, having enough protein is something that a lot of women often don't have just through, um, I think through like trends and, and ways that we, you know, like it's such a thing to like, when I would go out to eat with some of my school friends, it'd be like, we'd all get salads, but like have having protein has been like an active thing that I try and infuse into my diet but also knowing the food that you're eating um i've always made like my own nutrition bars for pre-performance and after because i'm not that into like shakes and so um learning more about like what i put into my body has helped me a lot um and then also having like that positive network of people around you is really important like 
Um, something that I found through COVID that's really interesting is like, I've gone through four hip surgeries and then also, um, with COVID, it's been a really isolating experience, but also a gratifying experience at the same time, because I've chosen my direct community of people that I see and interact with. So there hasn't been like the negative side. And I know that like, we can't always live in a world without negative. Um, and there's also the internet, but I just try and um, stay focused on like the people that matter to me and like seeing like we're all so individually loved by our individual networks and like feeling that over like when we're 80, like we're not going to care about if we weighed like five pounds more or five pounds less, like it's not a big deal. Um, so I, and I think it's just like an active reminder of that and like, um, I get a lot of confidence through climbing, which has been a struggle for me this year, like not being able to climb and um, have that feedback. So I think that finding like ways that you can feel empowered in what you do in other forms is pretty important to like just building that, that self-confidence. Awesome. Um, question from Joe. What's your best advice on how to push your climbing grade when lead climbing? Um, first, get comfortable lead climbing. So I've always been um, an advocate of like doing falls. Like I, I've been lead climbing since I was 10 years old and I'm still scared of lead climbing often. Um, and so I think that that comes down to like getting up to above the bolt and taking falls at the gym or outside on even like your warm ups, just to like kind of break through the glass of like what you feel. And then also getting on climbs that are harder than what you're necessarily used to getting on. Because like for me, if I get on a climb, let's say like my level is 510 and I get on a 511, then I'm like, I'm pushing myself on harder moves and like feeling what that next grade feels like. So I think it can really help with like, um, kind of, kind of pushing yourself just like even in practice can really be helpful. Amazing. Um, got some really interesting questions here. How long can you go for? <laughs> how long can I climb for? No, no, no. How long can you take questions for? <laughs> Oh, I'm here. I mean, I'm like, you know, I feel like I said at the beginning, like I need a glass of champagne because I'm really excited about <laughs> our election. So, you know, it's the middle of the day here. So I'll probably want to go move eventually. But yeah. Awesome. Um, so obviously some great news from LCAP from Emily Harrington recently. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I think it's awesome. I think it's like, and then someone mentioned Julia um Shinodari climbing a 9b <laughs> during like my presentation which is I think it's just like women are so capable and in climbing um they have the ability to outperform men as well um and yeah we're like we're seeing that unfold I know Emily really well and I know that this has been a goal of hers for a long time so it's it's pretty inspirational to see her pull it through um, question from Clara about social media and young athletes being thrown into the limelight. Um, does anybody prepare you for that kind of thing? Um, do you think young athletes need more support with that kind of public exposure? Yeah, I, I wasn't prepared at all. Um, I don't know now what the preparation looks like. Um, I know that it's, it's hard. It's like, it scares me to be honest, like thinking of when I was in high school, um, and didn't have like the same level of, um, internet as like so many people do. And, and like, um, we all make mistakes too. And that's the thing that is scary because, and I, I think that I guess back to my talk, like there's a difference between making mistakes and being a malicious character. And the person who did um, cyber bully me what made a malicious um, attack. But I think that when it comes to like mistakes, it's, um, you know, when I was like a 16 year old kid, I was like, not necessarily like the most humble or aware or, um, you know, like conscientious of my actions all the time. And that lives on, like that is cataloged on our internet database 
um, and opinions form really quickly on social media of like, I walked in, I, when I first moved to Boulder from New York City, I met quite a few people who were like, oh, you're different than I thought you were. And I was like, what did you think I was? And they, it's like a judgment based on social media, but there is like inevitably this wall that um, exists between, um, you know, what you can like freely say. And I think that talks, you can open up more, but um like, I don't really put my private life, for instance, on social media, um, yet it exists. So like all these things that are just kind of like hidden, like it's hard to fully be yourself on something that is so public. So, um, yeah, it'd be awesome if, if there were, more, if there was more like education and resources for young females, um, on the internet. Um, the great thing about this year in this format is that actually normally we'd have a room that just had women in it for the Women's Climate Symposium, but we've got a co-ed audience tonight. Um, yeah. Question from Mathurin, maybe I've said that wrong. As a male, what actions would you expect men to take to help this whole thing with women in climbing? Um, I think that at a corporate level, men sharing the space with women, um, and treating women as equals also at a corporate level for like if you're in the marketing industry really supporting diversity and inclusion through the athletes and the people that you hire to represent your brands um and then as men as like you know i look to um men as such a significant part of women's empowerment because it, an empowered man who empowers women is so monumental to lifting other women up and also setting the example for other men. Um, so I think that treating them with respect, not like mansplaining at the gym when a woman doesn't want like unsolicited beta advice or um, you know, just like talking to women as equals and also um, not, not, um, not sexualizing women, not feel, making them feel like uncomfortable I've gone through situations where I've thought that like me and another guy are friends and then all of a sudden like because I won't go on a date with them then like the dynamic goes off um which is always like it's curious to me so I, I think that like um there's a lot there but I guess like empowering women and, and not giving unsolicited advice would be like some action items for sure we've got quite a lot of people wanting to know what you're planning to do next um, so I really want to go back to Mexico, um, earlier this year, my, my 2020 plan was to do a route on El Cap and to climb this route in Mexico. And like, neither of them happened, um, because I've been, I haven't climbed for seven months, sparing like two weeks in between surgeries, um, by two reconstructive surgeries on my hips and, um, uh, the diagnosis for each is six months. So, um, I'm about, I'm two months into my second surgery, um, and getting back to just being able to move, um, like bike and swim are where I'm at right now. Next week, hopefully I can climb. Um, but maybe, maybe sooner. I don't know. My surgeon recommends next week. Um, and so I'd really earlier this year, I went down, um, I had this aspiration to climb, this route called logical progression, which is a 30 pitch climb in Mexico that's really stacked grades and apparently quite stiff for its numbers. Um, and to go and do it with another female. And um, when, so we were going to film it and the way that filming works is that there's always like static lines that the videographer is hanging off of in order to film. And the two guys who went down to set up the static route ropes for my videographer, Savannah Cummins, who is um, going to be filming. She was a part of my all-female crew. Um, it was her boyfriend who was climbing and um, let loose a rock that then um, cut his rope and it, he fell 1,400 feet. And it was, it was a really hard psychological phase um, of my life because not only did we lose a really good friend, but it was, you know, it was a tragedy um, that none of us predicted. And so I think that, that 
that climb speaks to me on so many levels and there's like such a psychological element of what um obviously we need to get over but um what i'd like to go back and and do for nolan too um and lizzie and m are the female reps for the royal navy and royal marines mountaineering club and they've been hugely inspired by your female only expedition um they're looking to do a female only expedition to aconcagua as a high altitude non-technical um and they would just like to know if you've got any advice in planning for such an expedition yeah i think that knowing as many details of what you're getting into is really important um preparing all of your food and like nutrition for each day is really important but also preparing for the worst so like if you know you want to you want to analyze all of your technical gear um i always like to lay out like my boyfriend who lives with me hates it because like everything is just like sprawled out and all over the house so it's like i can like see everything laid out before it goes into my bags um but that's kind of the way that i like to organize and so i start planning and and um packing like weeks out from actually leaving just so that then i can make sure that there's like nothing that i'm missing um and i always bring extra underwear <laughs> it's like side note <laughs> I think we'll take three more questions and then one very specific request, if that's okay. Oh, that sounds great. <laughs> cool. Um, question on competition climbing. Um, whether you think that it's necessary to have separate men's and women's competitions, or you think there will be a time when actually they put men and women in the same category? I think that's a great question. I, I think that like all sports, like women and men are, um, there, there are physiological differences between the two. Or, um, and of course, like I do believe that women can climb harder than men. And, and it all just depends, like climbing is such a subjective sport because on certain terrain, maybe some women outperform men and some, like I could be thrown on like a, and you know, I don't even know what grade to say right now because I haven't climbed. <laughs> a minute but um i could go on a climb that let's say is below my maximum grade but it not be my style and then that's like really hard for me um and so as far as like having women and men compete separately i think that 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 is something that i see as a part of climbing and um i don't really see a reason to like um take away that separation um but it could be cool to see some like exhibition events where women and men compete against each other. I think that we kind of see that though in the outdoors, like women and men are climbing on the same terrain. Absolutely. Um, question from Kat, um, who's an official and seen lots of young women dropouts of organized sports and something we're really keen at at WCS is to try and make sure that girls and teenagers have an access to climbing and also want to continue that through sort of those slightly more troublesome teenage years. Um, do you have any advice on keeping girls involved in sports? Yeah, sports retention is such a big thing um, with women in sports. I think it's like the mentors that women work with, um, also access to um, organized sports activities is something that sometimes falls off the wayside as as women move from like as as girls uh grow up um the women's sports foundation has been doing a lot of research around this exact subject so i i mean i i don't know it off the top of my head but that is a really good resource to look to for some research articles because that's that's a big part of what the foundation um funds is research around um girls retention in sports but uh, for me, like, I think that it comes down to like, who, what's our like social community and how are we supporting um, young girls to also see women that they look up to that are athletes, not just, um, you know, supermodels, like supermodels have their own strengths, but I think that we need to see like a diversity of role models. Awesome. Um, and then very, very serious question from Rafaela. Do you agree that one of the goals of feminism is that women finally stop having to feel like they have to prove themselves? Totally. I like, 
I just always wonder, like, do men also feel like, you know, some of these like imposter syndromes and like feeling like, um, like their success is constantly questioned and all of these things. And, and I'm sure some men do and some men don't, maybe some women don't. Um, but I do think that there's like such a harsh lens that's shown on women um, and constantly pitting women against each other that is, um, it's really toxic. And then finally, from the sublime to the ridiculous or possibly the other way around, um, Ashley wants to know if we can meet any of your dogs because Moose looks like the best crack dog. <laughs> oh my gosh. So I, I, need, I will journey the laptop to find him. But something that's really funny that I have up on my desk right now because he keeps chewing it is um, I was given this by a friend of mine that is Moose in pillow form. Um, but yeah, let me see if uh, I can find Moose who I put in the basement because he was barking. Oh, he's at the front door. Um, here's Moose. Um, yeah, can we see him? There we go. So yeah, cool. yeah, I made an Instagram account for him because otherwise I'd spam everyone with photos of my dog, which I kind of still am conscious that I do occasionally, um, but it's Moose Chaga. And uh, his name, I'm really into medicinal mushrooms and Chaga is like this kind of like king superpower immune boosting mushroom um, that really helps with controlling your central nervous system, which I see dogs as like a great uh, component of helping us control our nervous system. So, yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Um, cool. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sasha. That was absolutely incredible. And I can resonate with so much of what you're saying um, from my own experience in the sport. But it's been such an insightful talk. And the comments have been absolutely incredible. People have been really connecting with what you're saying. And it's... Yeah, there's just so much that you've experienced during your career. And I think that there's, I mean, we could keep talking and about this for hours and hours, I'm sure. But yeah, I just wanted to say a massive thank you for being part of the event and for sharing your journey with us. Totally. No, thank you so much for having me on. We still need to do our Instagram live about We do. Coming <laughs> back. So you guys can tune into that. Um, no, I really appreciate you having me a part of the climbing symposium this year and really respect everything that you guys are doing too. Oh, I, I actually really loved that, it was brilliant. And um, one of the things I actually now love about these online events is I got to listen to the whole of the talk. Normally at the events, I'm off like washing dishes or putting tarps up or sorting equipment out. And I actually got to sit and watch that. So thank you very much, that was great. Um, I can't wait to go back and read all the comments. Yeah. <laughs> definitely do that it was, there was loads of good comments um i just want to say that our next virtual event is on the 5th of december on zoom again so get yourselves registered for that if you're interested um it'll be a really good panel of women and men looking at um climbing and parenting and touching on all sorts of subjects ranging from getting back into climbing uh, supporting young climbers supporting your kids to climb climbing as a family what do you find fun what do you not um and yeah join us if you're interested that's on the 5th of december um, in the meantime, keep an eye on our social channels for any updates, YouTube channel as well now um, for any latest announcements. And also, Rebecca's asked me to mention the goodie bags, virtual goodie bags. Awesome. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Thanks, everyone. See you later. Thank you. Bye.